So it's a, it's a great honor to uh, be able to introduce uh, Kong Jian Yu. And I thought I might uh, say a few words about uh, his story, his long march, as I like to think of it, because uh, he, uh, we were talking earlier, and he said, well, basically, if you're going to be a landscape architect, you ought to be a farmer first. And uh, I'm looking here, I see there's an image of a farmer. But, um, and, and uh, well, I'm not a landscape architect, but I also had an experience in my life a long time ago when I was, as it were, something of a farmer. And, uh, uh, and after that, uh, he, in 1980, uh, was, I think, in the first class uh, in, a, in the Forestry University in, in Beijing. Uh, studying landscape architecture, and he was there for um, uh, both undergraduate and graduate. And and uh, and and then after that, he was five years a teacher in the same institution, and then uh, came to Harvard and was three years at the GSD in Harvard, uh, doing <coughs> I guess a doctorate, and then uh, to brief, well, not so brief, well, almost two years in the SWA landscape uh, firm on the West Coast, and finally going back to China, where he started immediately his own firm, uh, having the title Turinscape, and, um, and that was in 1998, I think, and in 1999, they won the first competition, and they, this um, institution has never lo looked back, and he is uh, extremely active there, and uh, um, uh, Michael Sorkin, who uh, who has this little publishing house called Terraform, has just published a remarkable book, which is a, collect a collection of letters that um, uh, Kong Jian Yu wrote to uh, various politicians uh, uh, in, in the Chinese uh, government, and also in local government, of course, mayors of towns, but also uh, the president of the republic himself, and and uh, it, it's really it's really a very illuminating book, and and I think it's perhaps uh, rather unique uh, that a, a practicing landscape architect would be so engaged in the in the task of uh, trying to uh, rescue the country from the depredations of uh, desertification and flooding and. And uh, well, of course, it's, uh, these are worldwide phenomena, but they're particularly um, uh, prevalent in China. And so I, I will not uh, delay uh, this much longer, but I should say that he um, has received uh, 12 uh, ASLA awards for uh, uh, landscape and uh, in and uh, um, five WAF uh, uh, Best Landscape Awards, and he has um, served on the uh, Aga Khan Architecture Award Program. He was elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2016, and received a Doctor Honoris Causa from Sapienza University in Rome in 2017. And with that, I will, I'm happy to present Kajian Yu. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Kenneth Frampton. Uh, it's really a great honor for me to be invited to speak in this lecture series. Uh, your book is a Bible you know, for the Chinese students, at least here, uh, uh, for, for many years. And also, so I really appreciate your work and admire your work. And certainly this time is a great honor uh, to hear to, uh, to, to speak uh, about my work, and certainly I will welcome you to as a critic again, to, to as my professor. <laughs> uh, so the, the topic I'm to, to, uh, to, to, to talk is uh, called deep connections and deep forms. So people might think that our world is more connected, mentally and physically than ever. You know, we have Facebook, WeChat, highways, pipelines, but we are not. So all these visible connections, the farmer working with the land, with a very simple tool, but a beautiful landscape. 
So that's basically I call the deep form. So the people may think that we are connected yeah, because of all these high tech, all this infrastructure, all these pipelines, power lines, but actually we are not. These, all, these visible connections are actually murders of those vis invisible symbiotic relationships between so the in, the essential natural and cultural elements and the processes. I will quote the beautiful mind, uh, Nasha, the, scien the scientist or the mathematician, uh, there's a dialogue between Nasha and, and uh, his wife, you know, Alicia, his you know, future will be his wife. I bet you are very popular you know, with the girls. I don't exactly know what I am required to say in order for me to have intercourse with you. But could we assume that I said all that? I mean, essentially, we are talking about fluid exchange, right? So could we go just you know, straight ahead to go sex? So even love today becomes such a simple process. Forget the whole process. So, and that's the result. You know, that's the result of all these messy results we have seen, particularly in China. Of 10% of the most fertile land in China is taken over by, uh, was taken over by uh, uh, urban development. 80% of Chinese cities are suffering air pollution. Flood, drought, two thirds of Chinese cities are suffering drought at the same time we have flood. Almost all the cities facing flood, annual flood. And 75% of surface water is polluted. 60% of underground water is polluted. And 50% of habitat, wetland particularly, get lost in the past 50 years. Now that's the situation as a landscape architect have to face. That's in China, of course, but certainly in us, in some part of the world also. And conventionally, the conventional solution of single-minded engineering, like the following, damming, dikes, pipelines, sewage plant, all these are actually, as I mentioned, murder of many deep relationships between the essential natural and cultural element and process, including water, food, nutrient, lives, and beauty. Now, these physical connections, connecting infrastructure, are therefore shallow connections and in shallow forms. And meanwhile, we are making big investment on creating forms to beautify our city. But more than often, these creators, uh, creations are wasteful and in fake forms. In the last 40 years, almost every year, China consumes over half of cement, a third of steel, and a third of coal of the whole world, and build something we call beautiful. So ubiquitous ornamental landscape you can see everywhere in China. Now that's why I call a revolution. I call it Bigfoot revolution versus small, gentrified, little feet. So that's a different value, a different aesthetics. Now today, I call this, this aesthetic is the aesthetic of ecology. So we need a kind of infrastructure, the nature-based solutions. So by planning and designing ecological infrastructure to connect <coughs> those interrupted relationships water, food, nutrient, and beauty. Such solutions result in deep forms that stand, out, that stand in contrast to shallow forms, which has only a superficial perceptual order and lacks the solidarity of a coherent process beneath the surface. Here, I describe as deep form, the terraces, rice paddy, productive, beautiful, high performance, sustainable, and the other is shallow form or fake form, unsustainable, consumative. That's 
And the shallow form can be at a larger scale. Now, this is the whole China's urbanization pattern. 70% of immigrants, 75, 70, I mean 70 percent of urban population are located in the flood, flood risk area. Now this happened in the last 40 years. So this is a, a, a shallow form of urbanization. So and the timeless independence of human culture <coughs> and nature has built up the deepest deepest bond between peasants and their farmland. Therefore, the creation of deep forms can be inspired by the wisdom of peasantry. I just talked with Kenneth about farming, how farming become necessarily part of my career. It's because I learned field making, irrigating, fertilizing, growing, and harvesting. Now this basic skills of farming because of survival meaning create deep form. You can see they're beautiful but they have high performance, functional. For over 20 years, my team at Twinscape and Beijing University have been testing such solutions in over 200 cities and showcases, uh, uh, showcased a number of uh, numerous replicable replicable models for healing and transforming our land at various scales. Basically, two levels of actions to create deep forms. One is planning to create configurative, configurative deep form. The other is a design to create transformative. Now, you cannot divide nature with culture, between culture. So you have to transform the, the, the landscape. So basically two categories uh, for my practice. So the first category is planning to achieve these configurative deep forms, basically ecological planning inspired by McHugh's design with nature, of course, across the scale, from national scale to regional scale. For example, at national level, flood, every year flood take only actually less than 1% of national land. But we invest hundreds of billions of dollars try to build walls to protect the city, to protect the land from being flooded. Why do that? Because we, we try to create those shallow form. So look at it. That's the result. So 70% of GDP actually produced in the floodplain. So that's, a, that's really a shallow form. Uh, we built a city in the wrong place at the first hand. So that's the project, the largest project my team did is to define the line between nature and culture. Uh, try to create a deep configurative form, a boundary between nature and urban development, and eventually develop the idea that what could it be deep form, which means adaptive to ecological process, particularly flood, desertification, agricultural land, and it come out this idea called the foothill strategy. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about this. At the regional scale, Beijing, for example, urban sprawl, four times spread, four times, and take over everything when the infrastructure goes, when the pipelines goes, when highway goes. We overuse the groundwater, drops one meter to two meters every year, every year. So all the river in Beijing region you can see dry out. But at the same time, the street get flooded every year, almost every year. In 2012, 79 people died in the car, on the street, and on the river, in the river. So we are in bad, fake form. So we developed this flood security pattern to tell the 
municipal government to tell to how can we create deep form, urban development, integrated with stormwater management, habitat protection, cultural heritage protection, and green bicycle lane, green, green transportation system. So it develops this landscape security pattern, infrastructure, a green infrastructure. And this green infrastructure will lead future urban development. So instead of urban sprawl without any frame, with any restriction, we say landscape will become the, the frame. This is what, what James, you guys told, uh, landscape urbanism. So landscape leading the way of urban development. And now this has been done almost uh, 10 years, uh, uh, 12 years ago, and been partly accepted. At a medium scale, 10 square kilometer size, for example. This is uh, a case we did also about 10 years ago. Instead of conventional way, you know, conventional way is leveling the ground, build infrastructure, lay out all this drainage system, pipes, gray infrastructure. Now we say, why don't take care, why don't protect all this pond system? They've been here for hundreds and thousands of years. The so farmers develop this, we call it sponge, sponge, the land, the sponge, regulating the monsoon climate. In dry season, they use water to irrigate. In monsoon season, they keep the water. So we develop this landscape as infrastructure, without pipes. I mean, without drainage pipes, of course. Use landscape as infrastructure to integrate drainage, bicycle, pedestrian, and park system together, and to develop this area. Save a lot of money. 15% of investment can be saved without leveling the, leveling the ground, without laying pipes, and create uh, infrastructure based on using landscape. That was rendering 10 years ago, and this was built. So the whole city, almost the whole city in Wuhan was flooded in a, a year ago. You know, it's, a, it's a big flood for the, uh, uh, basically urban inundation, urban flood. This town survived because we create this resilient landscape, not depending on the pipe lanes, pipelines. And this landscape become a filtrator, become sponge to regulate water, and we don't need water to irrigate the landscape, the trees. Save a lot of money. So this is basically the strategy of planning to create a configurative deep form across the scale, from national scale, regional scale, to urban, to the uh, 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 community or individual city scale. Now I, I want to spend more time on this, the second strategy, the design and the engineering to create transformative deep forms. These are very, these are typical transformative deep forms. Here you cannot separate culture from nature. So terraces, you don't know where is culture, where is culture, but the culture is dripping over the nature pattern. So, so it's deep form. It's deep form. And the building, of course, is, a, is a Italian in you know, or is a building beautiful. You cannot divide. You can separate nature from culture. How, how can we create an upgraded model for, of deep form to solve today's problem? So the first principle of first approach is to make friends with flood. Annual flood damage cost 10 billion, I mean 100 billion US dollars in China every year. And 10, 000, uh, 10 million people affected each year. Yeah. All rivers in China basically been channelized like that, been dammed and channelized in order to protect from being flooded. But that only makes the case worse. For 5,000 years, we are fighting against the flood by this kind of solution. So we take a nature-based solution. 
This is a case we, 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 we did at 2003 uh, in Zhejiang province. It's a river being channelized. And the mayor got a lot of complaints from the farmers. Because the farmers, uh, buffalo, have no place to, 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 to drink water. Usually, the buffalo go to the, the, the creek, to the river, to drink water. Now, the buffalo have no place to go to, to swim, to, 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 to bath, to, to, to get water. So he, he had to call, uh, call me as a landscape actor to, say, to see how can we find a, a better solution to make this you know, save buffalo, but actually also save people and, and, and to make beautiful. Certainly, the covers of nature. Eh? The process will remove the concrete and the carve the nature. But certainly that's based on science. So we analyze where actually the water goes. You know, so there's 10-year flood, 20-year flood, 50-year flood. So actually flood didn't go anywhere. You know, flood have place to go. So why don't you adapt to the flood pattern to create a urban development and a landscape so that we can have a deep form? Without war, so that's that's uh, before in 2002. Now that's today, again, transformative, transformative. Create a buffer, create a resilient landscape, so that we can adapt to this uh, uh, seasonal or monsoon climate. This uh, actually is a dike, and that's a uh, inner lake. You know that's uh, so share people and water share the space. Because monsoon only come for a month, two months. Flood can only come maybe for two hours. So why bother to build a line between the people and water? So these become a, a, a sponge, a sponge, a resilient. This is in my hometown, even more serious flood wall, a big river. So again, we are successful convince the local mayor Transform it, you know, remove all the concrete, and place with eco friendly landscape. Terrace it. So, terrace landscape. Learn, by, learn, learn from farmer. You know, very little, simple cut and fill create terraces. Become friend with, with water. Not against that. So, a hundred year flood come out actually immediately after the park was built. Now people get surprised, you know, the whole park being flooded. But just two weeks later, the flood goes, and the land becomes fertilized, more flourish, you know, more lush vegetation comes in, and when you do the dry season, the park becomes uh, 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 this kind of accessible landscape. So it's a resilient landscape. Make friends with flood, share, the space between, you know, between people and water. The second principle to create deep form is to go productive. As I mentioned, China has 20% of, of world population, but only have 8% of world arable land, and 10% of which have got lost in the past 30, uh, 30 to 40 years due to urban development. When you fly in to Hangzhou, you will see this, um, the massive scale of urbanization took over, and you virtually take over all this fertile land. So this case, built in 2003, I want to demonstrate that productive can come back to the city and use the space we have in the, in the, in the uh, and I mean, the green space can be productive. So this is the Xinyang Architectural or Jianzhu University, one square kilometer in size. So we collect stormwater and use the stormwater to irrigate the field and make the field for rice planting. And put students, put students, studying rooms right in the middle of the rice paddy. So that's a water collection pond, this is an irrigation system, this is a classroom. That was the site. Uh, uh, it was in, in uh, March, 
and the, the president of the campus went to the school of the school went to, to open the campus in six months. So how can you build a campus in six months? And he had no budget because he used all the budget for the building. You know, all the Chinese clients want buildings, okay, architects, right? Beautiful. But have no budget for landscape. And he want to make it unique, you know, beautiful still. How can we do it? So as I said, the rainwater is free. You know, collect the rainwater and irrigate the land and create a landscape which can be beautiful and no budget. Because all the Chinese farmers know how to cultivate the land. Minimum cost, even cheaper than a lawn, right? Than a piece of lawn. So that's a, that's become a really a rice paddy farm. And it's really there's a local farmers come in to raise to raise sheep here, you know, goats, sheep, and the students using the space, the professors here, uh, the study rooms, and they pass from the library to the classroom and they use the space. Certainly this is uh, post agriculture, you know, this uh, I mean, this is a productive agriculture, but it is urbanized. It's urban. How happy here, professor here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> because he can walk on the path, you know, walk on the path to the classroom of the field, of the field. But he's happy, you know why? Because he has shoes on, right? <laughs> if you have bare feet, you will not be happy. Like me, I, I, I walk in the farm with bare feet, right? So, and dressed. So that's a new aesthetics. When a population, when, when a population like uh, uh, 40, 40 years ago, only 10% or 20% of population in, in urban area, now we have 80, I mean, uh, uh, 70, uh, 50, 58%, 58% become urbanized. So about 80% of urban population have the loot in the farm. So now when they look back the farm, look back the, the rice paddy, it's a feeling of upgrade, you know, upgraded. A feeling of a, a kind of distance, but still connected. So the new aesthetics come to the society. You see people, the former farmers come back to visit the rice paddy here. Yeah. And the student gets involved for rice planting, they have rice planting season, they have harvest season. So it's become a cultural, performative, you know, activities. So that's a, and even in winter times, we keep patches of rice paddy in the field. Because I, as I mentioned, I was a farmer. When I was farm, my father told me that when you harvest the rice paddy, you better keep patches of rice in the field. You know, why? Because if, if you harvest all, if you cut all the rice, the rats, the rats will come to your house. Yeah? <laughs> but in this case, the animals, the birds, the rats will be kept in the field. <laughs> yeah? So the birds will watch it. You know, it's illegal. You know, they take off, take all these uh, rats. So that's, a, that's the ecology. That's the ecology. And certainly you produce food. Uh, so it become a, a treasures like a, like a, like a, 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 a token, <laughs> you know, iconic uh, token for this uh, uh, for this uh, campus. So that's an experiment, which is 15 years ago. Now we replicate this idea at an even larger scale. Here in America, we call it agricultural urbanism or urban agriculture. Yeah, this is a case in in Chuzhou, in Zhejiang Province. Chuzhou is a city uh, during World War II. The American force, air force, supposed to land in the city, but they failed, right? Because the distance to Tokyo to here. Uh, uh, but this is a city called the Chuzhou City. They have an airport at that time, uh, and that's a site you can see is an abandoned farm. And uh, it's a, 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 a floodplain also. Uh, that's a site. That was a site. An urban development happening surrounding the whole area, but abandoned farm. So we recover the farm and create a 
flood adaptive landscape, adjust to this, adapt to this river, and also make the landscape productive again. Uh, here, the fields become productive, but also urbanized. People can use this space. These are uh, uh, pavilions. We're also inspired by local pavilions for rest, for shade, for farming, but also for urban recreation. You can see the buildings totally surrounding these areas. Floating above this floodplain, you can have these uh, pavilions. Uh, so that's a site, again. That's a, we, the curve, we revive the agricultural technique, very simple agri agricultural technique, create this pond system to regulate water, the dry season and the uh, wet season, and they plant it, and they rotate it, you know, the crops. That's very simple, right? rotating. That's a very uh, ancient wisdom. So you don't have to fertilize the, 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 the soil because the crops produce fertilizer. Uh, so during the season, uh, sunflower season, you can have sunflower, you can have canola flower, you can have meadows year round, year round. So it's basically farming. You can see 20,000 people attracted every day to this park, particularly during the, uh, the flower season, flower season. And during the media, during the social media time, when one flower open, the whole city knows that. Uh, so it become a huge festival. Come to the now today, you can you just after three years you can see the lush vegetation, the floodplain, the pond, collecting water, and this is a skywalk, and this is cities growing, surrounding this this park, and certainly socially performative. Three, three yoga teams function here every day, every day. Yeah? So that's urban agriculture. Now we have several projects, more projects like that. Ah. The third value, as the third, I mean the third principle is to value the ordinary and the reuse and the recycle. Hundreds of millions of square meters were built in the past four decades. And it's the same amount of almost the same amount of buildings been demolished, million squares, every year, every year, yeah, like that. So we basically demolish all the old buildings. None exist, almost. Every city become lost with lost memory. So this is the first project I went back to, to China. In, it, was, it was designed in uh, 1999, uh, when a whole factory got bankrupted is in Guangdong, near Hong Kong, in Zhongshan. Uh, it's a shipyard park. 5,000, uh, used to, uh, uh, 500 people used to work here. Uh, so 1995, got bankrupted, built in 1950s. Uh, so what should we do? Uh, the mayor come to me and say, when I demolish everything, please come to design a fancy park for me. Uh, so when I saw the picture, I said, no, we should not demolish. When you demolish, we, we immediately get, you know, we lose, we lose contact with history. So I was able to convince him to stop the de process of demolition and design a park based on the existing industrial structures. That's the, the setting. It's a shipyard, it connects the river, have, a, have, a, have a, a, a lake in the middle. So we keep everything, including the trees. Every tree will be protected and keep the railroad and the buildings. So that, that was the site. Now that was built. So keep the, you can see the, the change of the city itself, the growing of the city itself. It used to be the very dirty brown field, and, and, and the land is, is so cheap. Now it becomes the most expensive area, becomes the living, uh, living uh, yard of the whole city. That was the site at the beginning uh, in 1999. Now transform it. So transformation adapts the flood. The river is connected to the ocean, so it uh, have a tide 1.1 meter daily. 
So this the terraces is designed to adapt as a flood, adapt as a, a tide, and the recovering the ecology of the site. At the another angle, the two structures are recovered. Uh, you, can, you can see here the three five-star hotels built around this park now. Uh, becomes the most sought after place. Uh, again here, we created the landscape which ties into the, to the waterfront, uh, make friend with the, with, with the tide, see the structure kept, reused, and the five-star Sheraton Hotel here, and the international five-star hotel. Here is the most expensive apartment building uh, in this area. That was as before. This is it today. Yep. Two, uh, 2,500 couples take photos every year here, wedding photos. So one of the most favorite wedding place in Pearl River Delta area. That was real road. This was built, uh, by the way, this is the same kind of real road. Uh, you guys did much fancy, of course. This one, is, we keep it rustic, you know, uh, messy. Try to create a messiness uh, to, to get the memory of the site. Now, it suddenly becomes attraction for these, uh, for these people. And become a fashion show place, right? a fashion show, yeah. So, I, so, so ordinarily, yes, for the first time, you, you, you guys know all about Chinese garden, you know, these uh, pavilions, uh, rockeries, these uh, uh, bridges, these uh, corridors, but we create this totally different aesthetics. Now at the beginning, these were totally uh, being, you know, uh, 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 controversial at that time. There's a, a huge jewelry for this project. And all, only one supports this project. All of them against this, because as they said they have nothing to do with the Chinese tradition. Yeah. So it's a new definition of aesthetics, a new aesthetics or new vernacular. I would say, the how can we value so ordinary? This kind of culture happened 50 years ago, 30 years ago. This is also Chinese culture, right? It's a red culture. You now we have this kind of, so we need something to, to remember, to remember those. So the entrance gate is a red box as entrance to tell the story of the red culture, of the past, uh, uh, I would say, socialist, socialism industry. That's an a entrance box. Very simple, but a totally a new interpretation of the Chinese culture. At the beginning, people don't understand. You know, they think it's very Western. It's totally Western. Right? But I told them it's totally Chinese. And look at this. <laughs> look at three, three kids. Two have red scar. Huh? In China, to wear a red scar it means you behave well. You, you, you're good behavior. Huh? You are, you, you are, it's a selected. It's, a, it's an honor to have a red scar. This one is have not. <laughs> <laughs> you see, he's poor, you know, very sad, very sad. Uh, yeah. And, and it's a color, Chinese color, China red. In America, it's a, it's a stock market these days, you know, red. But in China, if red is up, so, so color has cultural meaning. Uh, color has cultural meaning. So uh, that's, that's the trying to develop the vernacular Chinese or the modern China. Uh, the fourth principle, the fourth principle is to minimize the intervention, to maximize the return. But in the, in the past 40 years, all the engineering work is to maximize the, the change. A lot of engineering work, a lot of investment, a lot of concrete. Uh, can we do minimal? You know? So this is the case. You want to show, to demonstrate that if we do minimal, we can still have these uh, 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 make, uh, make uh, uh, provide services, but at the same time, we can also make totally uh, different landscape, beautiful. Now, that's a site in uh, coast city, Qinghuangdao, in, in, in North China. Uh, very dirty, but a messy ecology. 
you know, very lush. Yeah. Uh, as I said, conventionally, where people will remove everything. But here, we just keep as it is. Nothing, almost, almost nothing change. No terrain change, no movement of earth. Just put one bench, the red bench. The bench is 500 meters long. Uh, 500 meters long. And it can, can fulfill all desires of urban residents. You know, they want to seek in, uh, I mean, they want to seek uh, safety, seating, lighting, boardwalking. So that's all. That's what we need. We don't have to change the nature. So that's built. That's built. Just put one bench. The rest of them will keep untouched. Even these, we call the weeds. Yeah, messy weeds. Nothing has to be changed. In China, we have, you know, the landscape you will see, uh, Steve maybe saw a lot of this kind of, we have built ginkgo, you have, you know, pine, beautiful trees, but those are totally, I mean, costly, expensive. Here we got anything as it is, messy. But suddenly this place become a favorite place, a safe place for the people you can see. Uh, look at these three ladies. In the morning, in the night, they're still here. Yeah, a taxi. Yeah. All those space, because they, they feel upgraded, you know, they feel urbanized, modernized, even 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 though they are still in the messy nature. Now this I saw minimal intervention. You don't have to go to cosmetic surgery, a plastic surgery here, yeah, doctor. You just need a bend. You need a little little bend. <laughs> you can turn messiness into into beautiful landscape. That's what we did. The seedlings, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, again, nothing changed. Like this cleanup, just put a bench through it. Now becomes such an attraction for uh, uh, the, the resident, resident. By the way, in 2008, Kanda Nasta Traveler magazine in America named it as one of new seven wonders of the world. That year, <laughs> that year, together with this uh, uh, the Olympic a stadium in London and this is a tower, so it's a, uh, Dubai Tower. That was the site. Now that's a, that's a messiness, nature. Low maintenance, no irrigation, no fertilizer. That was the site. That's uh, in the night. People use it, even in the night, uh, in winter, and in the snow. Uh, and nothing changed. Just uh, put one bench. So this is a minimized intervention. When you think about China, you will have such meager resources, natural resources. So we have to keep all the natural assets as much as possible, but at the same time still get urbanized or get upgraded or get we call it civilized. Uh, the fifth principle is a good porous. Green sponge for a water resilient city. As I, as I mentioned, over 60% of Chinese cities are suffering urban flood. The conventional solution, of course, to drain away, we we'll learn from all the developed countries, build pipes, drain away all the water. But we are running out of water. So why don't we keep the water instead of drain away the water? So we are inspired again by the farming technique in Pearl River Delta. James, you, you did a lot of projects there. Pearl River Delta, like that, you know, like that. Porous. Before it was wetland. It was, it was, it was, you know, it was a messy wetland. But somehow, a thousand years ago, people come here to cultivate the land. What's the simplest way? Simplest way is to cut and fill. Cut, create a pond for fish, and fill it, create deck for mulberry. So that's why it creates a whole culture. So beautiful culture, but also you know, productive, porous. So that's the final solution can also be solved today's urban problems. So that's urban problem is a project in um, Harbin in North China. 33 hectares in size, right in the middle of a new town. It was planned as a park, but people don't know how to do this park. So I was called in to design a park like that. So I tried to test then. The porous landscape, this is a sponge, collect water, 
keep the water, clean the water, and recharge the aquifer. Now that was the site. Urban development, all right, surrounding the whole area. There's a the park. So it has on surface, uh, that's my first sketch, porous, cut and fill, left, leave the central alone, and uh, put uh, a walk above it. That's a cut fuel, cut fuel, put people above it. Now, the water run into it. So all the, spawn, all the storm water run into the park and filter it and cleans it. That's just a test, actually. Dirty water, cleaner and cleaner, and go charge in the middle. So minimum touch, again, leaves the central part open. That's a wetland created. So that's a set in the situation. As a, the first rendering, you can see the boardwalk above, the porous landscape, but that was biodiversity. And, and, and you can just use one machine, uh, not two. One machine, you create the landscape. So that's, about, that's the main benefit of the industrial technology. And minimize uh, the import. That was the site again, as of today. Uh, today. Uh, that's porous landscape. At periphery, cut and fill. Cut, fill, cut, fill, cut, fill. That's fill, cut, fill. So you can see all this filtration, porous landscape. That's a, a couple years later, you will see, you look at before, and no, no city here. Right? That's in just two, two years. So this become a central park, basically, of the whole, whole new town. That's filtrating system, dirty, cleaner, and clean water. That's a few, a couple years later, or like that. That's what's just built, first year built. So all system will be as porous, sponges, two years later. So filled with abundance of vegetations, adapt to this kind of wetland system. Now that's a test, you see. So the result come out, my student did a, a, a research, a PhD, actually do the observation based on this experiment. And we found that 10% of green space will be, nest, will be enough in this area to solve the urban inundation problem. No pipes. We don't need pipes in this case. Certainly in the South China will be maybe 20% maximum. So that can solve the problem of urban inundation use landscape and still at the same time not just only solve the urban inundation problem, but also you create a habitat and also public space for the people. And the birds, hundreds of birds come to the site in the city. So we also have bird watching pavilions, certainly a little form here. You can see bamboo, we test different materials, stone, rocks, wood to, as a pavilion to, to see, uh, to watch the nature, to experience the nature. And this idea can be at very small, at your backyard. So this is my small project in, in, in France uh, as a demonstration. How can you create your own sponge in, at your backyard? And that's as a backyard case. You can see in, this is in Mountain Shimon. Shimon in Mountain Shimon. That's, Shimon. So that's a, a, a small ring garden cut and fill and create a, a filtrating system and use the green water as a reflection pond to create uh, a little art. This become a fashion, again, a place for fashion show, you can see. Uh, simple, very simple. It's bamboo sticks, painted bamboo, uh, a pass. And what about, is if, you know, not, that, not about water, it's a soil, as mentioned, 60 over 60% of urban soil is polluted. Now that can be very expensive if you want to change it or if you want to clean it. I know in America we have law for, for soil, the brownfield. We just did a work in a, a small project in Seattle, the Hinghai Park. It's, we have to seal it, you know. You either change it or you seal it. Otherwise, you know, you, uh, you, you're not pass. So in, in China even, so we don't have this kind of law. But uh, if you want to clean this kind of landscape, in this case, Valley Auckland, you know, Auckland urban sewage run into this place, very dirty, of course. Again, we create a porous landscape, 
porous, that nature work, collect stone water, the rain water. The rain water is just acid. So when the acid water go together with the alkaline soil, you create chemical reaction, right? Create habitat. Different pH value will have different habitat. So let the nature take over. Then actually not so slow. In just three years, this kind of landscape will be transformed like, like that. P porous landscape. Collect stone water as huge, fairly simple cut and fill farming technique, but to create a totally different landscape, habitat. In deep water, shallow water, dry pond, so you have totally adaptive vegetation. The native vegetation created. You see, people actually love this kind of landscape. So was a, a, a couple of years ago, the, the government tried to gentrify this place and tried to create a park along uh, uh, books, uh, uh, you know, those. And the people against that. So they write a letter to the mayors and, and uh, to me, and we, we, we become a league, become a team to fight against gentrification of this site. So now this park basically keep like messiness like this. And this is functional. You know, this is a test to show how the pH value changed, how the soil quality changed, and how the native species increase in this, in this area. The seventh principle is a design ecologies for water cleansing. As I mentioned, 75% of the national surface water is polluted like that. Basically, all the lakes are heavily polluted. Certainly, basically, nutrient rich, you know, a fortress, you know, a fortress, nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, basically fertilizers. Back 30 years ago, farmers would love this because they can use you know, fertilizer. Yeah. But today, because of the industrial idea of buying the chemical fertilizer from the factory and they overuse it in the field and run into the lake and pollute the whole system. So we inspired by farming technique, the wisdom, based on understanding of social, I mean science and, and ecology, we create a replicable terrace model and design abstracted, quantified, and tested, post POE, post operational evaluation test, and it become replicable, and create a model, changes a new, create a new language to, to replicate across a scale, a different scale. Now this is an experiment built in 2009, uh, Shanghai Expo. It's 10 hectares in size, one mile long, as a site, heavily polluted water and soil. So we want to test this as, as a cleanser, as a living machine, to clean the water from very dirty, we call the fifth grade, fifth grade, to clean water which can be used, with swimmable clean water, use one mile long wetland, subsurface wetland, basically learned from farming, you know, terraces, aquaculture. So that's cascade wall to create oxygen in the water, aeration. Back in the sewage pond, you need the energy to run the aeration. But here, I should use the landscape. We created a, f a 300 meter long cascade wall to create oxygen and the, ox and the water become fertilizer and uh, you know, transform it. And plant loves this kind of water. That was a site, terraces, use farming technology, simple, and grow it. Terracing, grow it. Terracing, but here we want to demonstrate how different plant species can be planted and demonstrate to tell the story that water can be cleansed by, by plant. So it now become a, 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 a demonstration uh, to, to show. So after one mile, one week, each one drip of water from the source to the end, it takes one week. But a daily, one cube, uh, daily, uh, one hectare of wetland can produce 800 cubic meter of clean water like that and be used in, uh, uh, it was used in Shanghai Expo during the Expo time. And we certainly tested uh, to see how this is functional so that we can replicate. Now, 
is functioning very well. For over five years, all the data, we get all the data observation. Uh, so it's deeply based, this form is deeply based on this ecological process. Certainly you have harvesting, this process of harvesting. No? Basically farming, uh, rice paddy, beans, every productive crops is rotating again here, you rotate. And also you create this biodiversity. Uh, 20 species of birds come to the site. <clears throat> and of course, they will integrate with art, uh, with beauty. Uh, people, messy, native, native reeds, plants, integrate with uh, a, a little bit shape, form here. <clears throat> and become again a, a loved place in Shanghai. And again, we replicate this experiment at an even larger scale. This just finished uh, last, uh, <coughs> last year, <coughs> Haiko, Hainan Island, a tourism island. But it was notorious for polluting all the rivers like that, like that. These are just, these are photos just two years ago, just two years ago. So that's the whole river. So we are going to transform the whole river, use this idea of technique, very simple, deep form, remove the concrete first, because they didn't help, they didn't help to clean the, the water. Um, but the engineer just keep trying these things for, for, for 20 years. It didn't work. So that's the landscape we are calling in to, to have a different approach. That was basically a, a garbage site you know, before. And we terrace it, farm it, create this uh, terrace landscape, and clean again this air. That's right, yeah. So, not only is the urban stormwater runoff, but also sewage. So sewage, very simple treatment of sewage, clean up, you know, also the smell and, uh, and uh, uh, bacteria. So the rest of them were just uh, fertilizer. So we use this agricultural process, the harvest, to clean up the water, and also at the same time, create beauty. Yeah? People love it every day. Hundreds, thousands of people use this park. As you see, become a recreational park. Certainly, everything is designed. It's a designed ecology. It's a designed system. But here, even here, you can see how the buffer create water ch uh, change of color. You see, dirty water, clean water. Even here, you can visible. Certainly, you have place to, to take a rest. Uh, that's uh, the water run into the ocean, being cleansed, and you take place, you have resting place, you have ocean. And also, we observe it. We have all the data to show people that this landscape is performative. You can use it everywhere, basically in China, to replace those expensive uh, 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 sewage plant, in some case, in some case, not always, but in this, when the, the, the water is nutrient rich. And so the green solutions, I mean, all these models can be used, integrated for whole river system or for whole city. Now, this is a long river in, in, in this city, about uh, uh, 12, 12, meet, uh, 12, mile, uh, 12 kilometers long. Uh, that's the case. That's the existing, existing pre existing. And so we clean the river, integrating all these techniques I mentioned, stormwater collection, cleansing of soil, and, uh, and water aeration, and create, transform this landscape, as is before, as after, before, after, before, as after. Yeah, certainly you will have these urban furniture for student use, for people to use, and, uh, and become such a I welcome the green corridor for the whole city. And the catalyst is urban development. And it's a, the real estate doubled in just two years at both sides of the river. So the whole city can be transformed. We imagine, you know, that's the site of the city called the Liu Panshui City in West China. It's an industrial city. 60 square kilometers in size. It's almost one million population. Uh, pollution. Water, storm water problem, 
channelize the concrete uh, uh, river. So the river runs through it. So de-channelize it. Remove all the concrete. Recover all the tributaries, all the, 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 the uh, uh, stormwater run uh, uh, system. Landscape. And put patches of wetland. <coughs> cleanse it. And uh, not enough. We put all the palm system. We put a sponge across the whole city. So basically, you create a, a sponge city. And that was before. Two years later, we were like that. Fish come back, you know, soften. So the, the river being soft. It was before, two years later. The pond system, inspired by farming, is a pond system. When the pond are linked together, they will be functioning as you know, cleaning system, a filtrator. Also create a habitat for biodiversity and also a park. The people use, yeah, a lot of people use it every day. Now this has become an international uh, wetland park uh, 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 named as, uh, you know, uh, give, uh, even give identities to the whole city. Not only in China, other parts of the world also. Russia, this is in Kazan, Tatarstan, Kazan, a lake polluted. You know, industrial, it was a brownfield. Uh, uh, so we get this uh, competition awarded, and they are very quick actually. They build this in one year. Huh? That was our rendering at the beginning. That was a site before. Huh? It's the same idea of, of fuel trading system. It was built because it's, a, it's got a, a, a World Cup, a football World Cup. Yeah. So these, uh, uh, that was built. They were built in May, and uh, they told me every day, 50,000 people, 50, visit, visit this site. It's a waterfront, you can see, it's a waterfront. Again, this is a terraces fuel treating system to clean the water. Again, create a urban waterfront for people to use. How packed, whole city come to this, this place. And of course, we have the biodiversity. <laughs> Man, nature, eventually come together. And finally, we can build the deep form in home, integrate with the building, even though very small solution. But imagine, in China at least, 50 billion square meters of buildings, and two billion squares of buildings increase every year. And almost none of them is green building, energy efficient. Almost all of them are wasteful. And it consume a third of national energy consumption. 30% energy is consumed by all these beautiful buildings, beautiful cities, lighting you know, every night like that. So how can we do that? You know, how can we do a little bit work and transform it to become green city or green building? So this is my own apartment. Collect stone water solar energy, and it turns the balcony into a productive balcony, uh, vegetables. And another, park, another balcony will be a, a, a rain garden uh, on the balcony. It's the fifth floor, so it's a productive vegetables. So I can collect from the roof every year 50 tons, 52 cubic meters of, of storm water from the roof, and irrigate, store it, you know, store it, irrigate. And, and produce 32 kilos of vegetable for salad, for salad, for the kitchen. That's another little balcony, storm water, gardenia. So from, that's my back, not my bedroom here. Yeah, it's just open. You feel fragrance, you know, every day because gardenia. We have all these different osmanthus, all kind of flowers. So you still feel, you know, in the night you get all this fragrance, and in the bedroom. I mean, in the living room also. The wall transformed into a living wall. Now, this living wall is different from the, those living walls in the, in the airport. Right? You, you saw those living walls are very expensive. You have the you know, nutrient, you have the fertilizer, you have make a container. Here, we make of rocks. All these plants just come out from the rock. You know what? That's, a, that's a, a my observation. 
I built, I, I mean, I transformed the building uh, as an apartment in 2009, and they come out of this moss, mosses. Next year, fern come in. Huh? Third year, fourth year, oh, the fern take over, become abundant. Now that today, uh, that's today. <laughs> Very little maintenance. You just irrigate this wall, use the storm water. And this wall create some gas called a geo smell. Geo smell. You know, the smell, the geo smell. Scientists uh, uh, report say that it, become a cure, it can become a cure for depression. Uh, if you have this wall, you, <laughs> you don't need to take any medicine for depression. <laughs> now, uh, but more important, it's cool off the whole apartment. I do not turn air condition in the summer. And in the winter, it get evaporate, you know, humid, humidifies the whole building. Because in China, in Beijing, it's very dry in the, in the winter and very hot in summer. So I live with it, and I can save a lot of energy. 2,000 kilowatt of energy can be saved without turning air conditioning and, 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 and uh, humidifier. And so become a learning center. And people come here I, every month. I have to give lectures sometimes. Yeah? Yeah. Communities, people come here to learn. Now, that's a very small solution, but for big problems. Because if all the building can save one third of energy, we can virtually demolish all the big dams in China. We can virtually have, don't need any hydro powers because those are very destructive for the overall landscape. So that's a small solution for big change. So to conclude, I would say, facing the unprecedentedly massive scale and unsustainable transformation of the Earth and the devastating ecological degradation, obviously the sad effects of industrialization and urbanization, we need to revolutionize our approach to reconfigure the relationship between nature and development, and heal the transformation, and heal the degrading environment as a land. So that I call the big fit revolution. The nature-based and performative solution to create deep connections and deep forms. And that's a, that's a, this is an image back 2,000 years ago, how the Chinese vision, you know, see the relationship between the land and the people's settlement and the people's construction on the land. So we think, think like a king, <laughs> the big, the nation, huh? the, the, the globe, but act like a peasant. All the technique, all the technology, all the design, actually a, a, a peasantry, a peasant technology. Cut and fill, growing, irrigating, fertilizing, harvesting. Uh, that's the most efficient, most cheap solutions. But in order to like a king, you have to convince a king. Right? You have to make a make king to believe. That's why uh, Michael's talking. I don't know, uh, Michael uh, is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he asked me to advertise his book, <laughs> by the way. So that's his new book called Letter to Leaders of China. Because a leader is so powerful, like a king. You have to convince them. If you can convince the kings, you can solve the problem. Transform the earthscape, the whole national landscape. But still, you need this is a skill I call the design ecologies, inspired by farming, by peasantry. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I think it's great the way you end with your own apartment. <laughs> and, uh, and this wall, which is unbelievable, and the transformation of the wall. Yeah. And, and what, is the, what is it, the name of the gas that it gives off? It's called so geo smell. Oh, the the yeah. environmental engineer usually want to get rid of from the from the water, you know, because it smells mm. dirty, smells. Mm. So when you go to a mountain, you, you can have this smell. Mm. Uh, it, it's a reaction between some bacteria and this mm. water. Mm. Mm. So there's a rock, it's mm. very simple. The rock actually is a porous, porous lamp, lampstone. Mm. Mm. 
So what I mean is that you work with nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> right. Thank you for that talk. It was very inspiring. Um, but you end with this comment about convincing the king. And do you think that China is a particular situation? Because once you're able to convince government officials, they have, they function obviously in an autocratic country, they might function differently than in another setting. Yeah, uh, two cents, I would say two cents. First of all, think like King, which means you have a vision. You need a vision. This can be anywhere. So you, you, you take the whole globe as your own territory, your kingdom, your kingdom. I think that's why we have to think big. As a landscape architect, we think global. And I think uh, as the whole territory, national, continental, as a globe, as a, as, as a territory. So particularly in this time of climate change or globalization, we have to think a big picture. Uh, but how can we make this vision to work? Now, in different, how, how to realize this vision? In different systems, we have to work differently. In China, we, we have this top-down system. So physically, the king is powerful, right? Physically, we have to have this structure, this administrative structure. So if you convince the, the top leader, you will basically make the work you know, finished. So your vision become his vision, or his vision you know, we, we becomes in the right direction. We, so that's a, uh, a top-down system. But here in America, you have this uh, bottom-up system. So the vision is a king, but you have to work with the bottom-up. Because the king is, is voted by this, you know, these individuals. Uh, I, I did some work here also in America, in some small piece, like Boston Chinatown Park and uh, uh, Seattle Hingham Park. It's, it's very small. But uh, I know, I think this process is totally different. Here you have all the public healing. <clears throat> yeah, you have to go to meeting, 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 you know, you have so many. <laughs> And that's a process to convince the public. I, I think it's, if you, you know, that's a, that's a different way. But in China, you know, you, I, I think it's a system, in some way, work with the environment, maybe more efficient. If you have the right idea, if it's a pickers idea, like the Sponge City now become a national movement. Because the president mm -hmm. loves his idea. So he, he, he promotes his idea. And, and it's a whole machine, the national machine work for creating Sponge City, national scale. I think, James, you, you, you work with a Sponge City also, right? <laughs> In China, yeah. So I, I think that the vision is keen, but, keen, but uh, I think it worked differently, uh, differently. Mm. Yes? The pollution that obviously generated all of these conditions that you were working to solve came from the industrial peak push from China. How much pushback have you gotten from businesses while you're doing that? Why, why I'm doing that? For, for my own business or for their no, business? No, no. Pro, uh, companies in China resisting that. Resisting this kind of project? Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, actually, at the beginning, yes. At the beginning, I mean, I started with myself and my wife. You know, we started with you know, Ground Zero, right? We have, now we have 600 people in 20 years. Uh, so you will see that people actually began snowboarding, you know, began to accept this idea because we have already something built. They experience it, they, they see it, they, they visualize it, you know, they can see it. So I think it's basically this, okay, this one, story, one part of the story for the private company, for, for business. And also the business as a total, the property value doubled tripled, you know, in two years, in three years, because of this kind of project. So they are convinced, they're convinced. Uh, secondly, in, in China, the most of my, pro my project is actually paid by the government. So it's a municipal project, it's a civic project. So, uh, so that's why you, if the, the mayors, you convince the mayor, the mayor <coughs> like this, you make work done. Yeah, in two cases, I mean, but uh, which also means that the mayor gradually pick up these ideas, say, 
you know, in China, as soon as you have a, a, a successful project, exposing media, the mayor will come to visit. And particularly also in, in my case, I, I speak to mayor's forum each year. You know, in China, we have mayor's forum, say, training mayors. Because the mayor change every four years, you know, <laughs> you have to tra keep training, you know, keep training. Uh, so I give give talk every year, like uh, maybe 20, 30 lectures to mayors forum. Sometimes 200 mayors altogether. Now that's very efficient to transform. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's I think fun. So you show them examples. They, they get idea. Yeah. Over there. Yes. At the end. And besides, they are, they are inexpensive. You know, besides, they are, they are cheap to, 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 to build. Thank you for the lecture, Dr. Yu. Um, I'm just curious about like implementation of feng shui, whether it has become part of your design philosophy. Because you mentioned earlier you had experienced the cultural evolution, and they kind of hinder superstitious, like full old as a factor of it. Like, can you talk more about it? Can you, can you make it a bit clearer? It's hard to hear you. Can you stand uh, up? The implementation of feng shui, whether it become your part of design philosophy. Feng shui, OK. <laughs> That's another topic. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I, actually, I, I, I'm very interested at the beginning. In my early career, I, I, I have a book, actually, on feng shui. So basically, geomancy in, in English. Yeah. Dev, Devin, yeah. you know, yeah. find a location. Yeah. Uh, Indians, do, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a American Indian also have same, same idea of finding a location which have good feng shui. So feng shui is actually very simple. You know, it's just uh, for survive, a best location, adapt to the nature, you know, good, good view. Good view means you have prospect and you have refuge, you know, there's a theory. By, by the English writer called Appleton. Uh, mm. He had a theory called prospect and refuge. So you hide yourself and, uh, and can, be, can see other people. So that's good feng shui, basically. So it's uh, evolved based on, you know, you secure, feel secure, safe. Yeah. I, I, and the, uh, the practitioners in, in Hong Kong, they have very complicated <laughs> feng shui practice, which I, I, I really, I, I, I doubt about this <laughs> necessary, <laughs> but uh, but to me, feng shui is an early version of landscape practice. Okay, sighting, find the best location, avoid any any disaster, uh, to get the most benefit from nature. Yeah. There was another question there. Yes. Um, hi. Hello. Thank you for such an interesting uh, lecture. It was very inspiring. Um, I had. What you named, and I would like also if you could expand a little bit, the idea of urbanization, and so how the villagers were asking for that urbanization, and then you made, for example, in your uh, one bench project, right? That was uh, the implementation of urbanization. So if you could expand on that a little bit, I uh, will be interested in hearing a little mm. bit more of that. And also the, um, the cultural aspect, from, in this case, uh, China by using the pond or the farmer's culture into creating a new landscape. Because, for example, if we look now at uh, New York's uh, future plan and how they look into climate, it's more a war on climate, as in we need to defend ourselves from that climate. But this is a whole different culture, and it changed. Mm. So um, um, if you could expand a little bit on those two mm. concepts. Okay, yeah. Well, the first question is about uh, why, the, how the red bench can make people feel urbanized or feel upgrade or feel gentrified or feel get identity or something, right? I think that's, that's a whole story about, you know, the balance between ecology and art or ecology and uh, human, human mark, right? Human become human because they want to put marks, right? They want to create their own identity. Even, even tigers want to put their own identity, right? <laughs> <laughs> scratch, to scratch the tree, right? Yeah. So I think that's necessary. People want to, but the thing is that how much is necessary, how much is needed to put your mark on the landscape so that you create your own identity. So a piece of art, I think that's enough. Maybe, yeah? You don't have to transform the whole landscape. Uh, 
And, and that's, that's why the Chinese rural villages, farmers, they, they, they wanted to be, you know, upgraded, be, become urbanized. They're looking for this, you know, the high, yeah. So that, that's, I, I think, so it's a little piece of red bench, modern contemporary design will, you know, minimize the impact of nature, but also maximize the people's, you know, feeling of put their marks on the landscape. The second question I will say uh, uh, about is a culture, is a cultural trans or culture transition or something, how you, cult basically culture is ecology. I would say culture and ecology is the same thing. To me, the one definition of culture is ways of adaptation to natural environment. That's why you create diverse, diversity of culture. You, know, you have dry land, you create dry, dry land culture. In my country, in, in Southeast Asia, we have, I talked with, we just, uh, uh, Kenneth just discussed, we have this aquaculture, you know, it's a monsoon climate, rice paddy. So in order to grow rice for survival, you, you, you need to terrace this land. Well, back in, in, in England, in your country, well, you don't need a terrace because mm. the, 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 you have very mild climate. Mm. Right? Mm. You pasture landscape, you, you just raise cattle. Mm. So you create total diff, diff, different cultural approach to the adaptation, to adapt to, to, to the landscape. Well, climate will change, will change this. If too much rain fall into England, I think you need to terrace the land also. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, you, you create erosion, you know? You, you create, you, know, you need a you, you need another mm. crop mm. in order to survive. Yeah, I, that's why I think culture and nature here will come together. Mm. Ecology, um, will adaptation is culture. One, one just here in the, maybe that's the last one. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so very much. Um, since you inspired us to think as a king, I have a rather big but very abstract question. Um, and I've been thinking that actually, even though we tend to think of China as an industrial powerhouse, but actually cities such as Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, are really post-industrial cities already. We've moved all of the cities into um, the surrounding countryside. So we are dealing with a situation whereby the majority of the population <coughs> are actually living in post-industrial conditions and in that sense, China today is not so different from America. And I wonder um, if you have an ultimate vision about where should we live? I'm very inspired by your idea that human beings are stupid. We've always picked the wrong places to live. <laughs> where the flood will come and or on top will build houses on top of sinkholes and so on. But ultimately, Xi Jinping is trying to get people to move back to the countryside. And yet, um, most of your projects, if not all of your projects, are actually in new areas of old cities. So I'm just trying to think if you have a, a way to get us past the post-industrial present. Past, post, post-industrial. Get, get beyond the post-industrial. Yeah, get beyond. Po <laughs> I, I think you're right. I think this question is, uh, is a very serious. It's a, way, it's a way of how we urbanize, how we create a, a new civilization or lifestyle. I, I still think that we are in a wrong track to try to push, emigrate, you know, go to the city. Still, I mean, still, the, the, the government still try to, to urbanize, I mean, to put more, uh, to, to encourage immigrants from the rural. So abandon the village, the village is decaying, you know. Um, a third of the, of the buildings empty. So actually right now we have, we, we are thinking of to revitalize those villages, at least in some suburban area, at least in some area, the village will be become, uh, you will become revitalized or become best look uh, for the future, the best location for the future. Uh, we have several tests right now. Uh, so as another subject, we, are, we try to create 
uh, a new lifestyle in those villages which is accessible because it's a speed train, because of the highway. So make those villages become a future ideal place for people to live, to walk, uh, to enjoy life, and it's particularly for old, aged people. Uh, I st I, that's why I think the urbanization in China is uh, much being pushed. It's, it's, we make a mistake, and still making mistake. Uh, that's why I, I think uh, we can avoid all those mistakes. For, for example, building over the, the flood plain. But uh, because China you know, intellectually uh, or professionally, we, we have 10 years of cultural revolution, which we have nobody been educated in to do right planning, to right design, to right ecology. You know, I, I mean, I, we still think you know, the American is the best model for our urbanization, right? We still follow that Los Angeles model. We're still building the highways as a as urban sprawl. Because we don't have people, enough people, to get, you know, get up to this uh, top level to understand this, what's, what mistake we have made here. You know, we don't know Jane Jacob, I mean, it's a great success. And we don't know Mahag in the 1970s. We the first time I read in Macar's book is the, the whole city, the whole city only one copy. And the import of the book is controlled by the ministry. So you, you have to go into the oh, really? particular place to read the book. That's amazing. Now, mm. So there's a whole generation we're missing mm. you know, mm. to understand what is a good way to urbanize, to, mm. to develop, to, to modernize the city. So I think we miss a big mistake. Mm. Uh, we miss a big opportunity. Mm. Uh, that's why right now, mm. uh, still China a long way to to, mm. to go. We have still maybe another uh, uh, several hundred million people <laughs> go to the city, right? Yeah. So that's why I think we need to take it, a revolutionary thinking, that's ecological thinking. Yeah. Good way to end, I think. Thank you. Very <laughs> Thank you. Much.